effect in the cloud. Okay, so you'll see the recording notice. And yeah, Dave, if you want to go ahead and share. And then again, the schedule. Uh, this is the final lecture of the day, but then we will have a break and the recitation will start at 8, 8 p.m. 20 hundred uh, euro time. And I will check and find out about the um, uh, recordings and where we will post those. Uh, actually, is, uh, is Frank on at the moment? Uh, no, Frank is not here. I will have to find out from Frank. They're recorded on the CERN system, so we have to see whether you guys can see them directly on the CERN system or whether we upload them to YouTube. But we will try to do that for anyone that missed the morning lecture. I will try to get that posted. So. Uh, Dave, uh, I think we're all set. Okay, thank you. Let me put on my slides here. There we go. You should be able to see the slides. Looks good. Very good. So we can just continue from where we left off. I want to talk about renormalization and the QCD running coupling, which is big at large distances and small at small distances. And it's pretty amazing really. So in one sense, the topic here is how quantum field, field theory hides the true nature of what's going on. So I wanna talk about what renormalization does, then the, renormaliz the running coupling of QCD, and then the choice of scale, which is, there's a scale involved and you have to choose what it is. That's always a little bit controversial. And uh, something about physics beyond the standard model and what that has to do with renormalization. And then later on, we'll be able to go into deep elastic scattering. So what does renormalization do? Here's a picture in a space-time picture of electron positron goes to, uh, hadrons. And if you look in detail at what's going on right in the middle of there at short distances, if you expand that out in perturbation theory, you'll see things like this. So there's a vertex correction, maybe a gluon exchange between the quark and the antiquark, or there's a propagator correction on the uh, quark. And those directions can have very, very big momenta going around in a loop, much bigger than one TeV. And the, those diagrams are not small, they're big. So how can you take them into account? And that's what renormalization does. It accounts for the effect of those diagrams with huge momentum going around while eliminating the details about what's happening in there. So physics of time scales, time much smaller than some one over mu, where mu is the renormalization scale, times much less than that are removed from whatever perturbative calculation you're doing. But those effects still have do something. Uh, they're accounted for by adjusting the value of the coupling. The alpha strong now becomes alpha strong of mu, where mu is the scale that you chose in order to do a calculation involving those kind of diagrams. And, well, okay, I've oversimplified this a little bit. There's also a running mass, m of mu, and the field operators that you're using have mu-dependent adjustments to their normalizations. Uh, also, renormalization by dimensional regularization and minimal subtraction, which is what everybody uses, is not exactly the same as just imposing a cut that delta x is bigger than one over mu. But those are details. The main idea is that the small time physics is just put into the couplings and some other things in the, in the theory. So let's get a picture of that. Here's a virtual photon coming in. It makes a quark, the quark emits a gluon, but the gluon splits into 
quark and an anti-quark, which furthermore exchange a gluon. And the, that's a two-loop correction to this diagram. And the momenta going around in those loops can be very big. But it can all be summarized to some accuracy by changing the coupling that goes there instead of really computing that whole diagram. So uh, I'm omitting details of how you do these kind of calculations, but the effect of it is to sum the effects of the short time fluctuations of the fields so that uh, if I make a graph with log of time scale on the axis here, then long times uh, bigger than log to one over mu are done with a fixed order calculation. So to the extent that this is a diagram that has um, not so much momentum going into it or going around, that is to say times, the time differences between all those vertices is big, then I just actually calculate that diagram. So I do a fixed order calculation. But the part of the diagram that has to do with short time scales, short distances in space time between all those vertices, that's done with renormalization and then the renormalization group. So let's talk a little about how that works. The alpha strong of mu that you get out of doing a calculation has a perturbative expansion. So it's alpha strong of M. Well, what is M here? M is, say, the ultimate cutoff of, of the theory that I'm, ultimate momenta that I, beyond that, I don't know what's going on. So it's, uh, say, grand unified scale, or it's gravitational kind of scale, some very, very big number. So if I expand my alpha strong of mu in terms of alpha strong of that big number, then a one loop diagram gives me a number, which is called beta naught, over four pi times log of mu squared over m, times alpha strong squared of m. And then if I do a two loop diagram, uh, like I showed you, well, all two loop diagrams, then I have beta naught squared, log squared, and alpha cubed of m. And you can see if I just sum up that series, it's got a very simple form. Uh, alpha strong of M divided by one plus beta naught alpha strong of M. Terms in this series where it's say alpha strong cubed, but not log squared, but just one log. Uh, and beta is something called beta one there. So these are the most important logs that we're summing up and they just sum up into this nice formula. Uh, that same formula <clears throat> is often written as four pi over beta naught log of mu squared over some number lambda, that's the QCD scale. Lambda squared, lambda is a order half a GV or something like that. Uh, mostly you don't write it that way, but people used to write it that way. So you may see it in the literature, but the common way to write that is alpha strong of MZ, the Z boson mass times divided by one plus beta naught alpha strong of MZ log of mu squared over MZ squared. That's the same as the first formula, just substituting mz squared for m squared. And those two formulas are exactly equivalent. I invite you to just uh, do the math to show that those are all the same thing. This, this, and that are all the same thing. So what do you see there? If mu squared gets to be bigger and bigger, then this denominator gets to be bigger and bigger and alpha strong of mu gets to be smaller and smaller. That's called asymptotic freedom. The coupling gets to be smaller when the associated scale gets to be bigger. 
And similarly, if mu squared gets to be smaller, heading down toward one GV, this is a then a big logarithm, but it's negative and it makes alpha stronger mu bigger. So that's the running of alpha strong and there's formulas, these simple formulas for it that you use. When you put in your computer at one little quarter, this is the formula you put in. That then leaves us with the question of what do we do to choose that scale mu? Uh, it's a free choice. So let's just consider the total cross section for electron positron goes to hadrons through a virtual photon. At zeroth order, it's just alpha squared divided by q squared. Um, that is the sum of the squares of all the partons that contribute and one. So one is the Born cross section. Uh, I'm not even counting that. The one plus delta and delta is gonna depend on mu. So now you can do a calculation. Delta of mu is first of all, alpha strong over pi. So that's uh, simple enough. It's a, more or less an exercise. Everybody can do that one. The next term is uh, some numbers that come from group theory and things like that. Uh, 1.4 plus or minus 1.9 times log of mu squared over q squared plus alpha strong squared. And then plus something with numbers and log of mu squared over q squared and log squared of mu squared over q squared times alpha strong of mu, not alpha strong of m, alpha strong of mu cubed. So that's the cross section for electron positron annihilation. And it's got some kind of complicated behavior with logarithms. Uh, just looking at that, one thing you can see is you should choose mu squared, something like Q squared. Q is the total electron positron uh, momentum or the total momentum of all the hadrons. Because if, if you choose mu squared really 100 times Q squared or 1 100th one of Q squared, then all these logarithms are big. And then this convergence of this perturbation series is just messed up. I might mention this series does not converge, but uh, successive combinations, successive terms are smaller and smaller by bigger factors of alpha strong mu. So it's effectively not converging well if you make those logarithms big, because the big logarithms cancel out more powers of alpha strong. So mu squared, something like Q squared is surely what you want, but it's not so clear just exactly what mu squared should be. So let me make a graph now. Here's my formula. The coefficients all depend on mu. Alpha strong of mu depends on mu. However, mu is just something you put in. It's not part of nature. So the exact delta, if you imagine you're somehow able to get it from uh, performing a functional integral, the exact delta doesn't depend on mu. And what that means is that the derivative of all those coefficients times the alpha strong of mu to the n, if I sum that series up with n terms, the derivative of that with respect to log of mu uh, should be zero up to the order of the terms I've counted. So up to order alpha strong well, the remainder is alpha strong to the n plus one because I've got everything of order alpha strong to the n. So the difference gets to be smaller and smaller uh, for reasonable values of n there, up to n equals 10 or so, I think. Uh, so the more terms you have, the less mu dependence there is. Okay. So now what scale should you choose? Uh, well, as I mentioned, the scale of mu much different from Q is not good. But what if um, you chose something around Q and then how would you estimate the error if you knew only the alpha S squared terms? 
So I want to just look at that with a graph. So that's a graph. Uh, alpha strong of MZ, let's say I said it's a 0.117. Now we know it's more like 0.118, but I'm not concerned about that difference. I'm taking a rather small value of Q from the ancient times, five flavors of quarks, and I'm plotting delta of mu versus the log of mu. So I write mu as two to the P times Q. So P is proportional to the log of mu. And P is here on the horizontal axis. So it could be zero, it could be plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two. And at first order, here's the curve I get. That's just the alpha strong of mu. And it's decreasing as P gets to be bigger, mu gets to be bigger. Uh, that's actually not too helpful because I have not too much of an idea where to choose mu, that is what P to choose. Probably around zero somewhere. So somewhere around here, but it, you know, it's a falling fairly fast. But what if I include now one more term? So we saw what the one more term is. I get that red curve. And now I have a little better choice of what to, how to choose P. So P around zero wouldn't be too bad. Uh, sometimes people like to say, well, the whole answer is independent of mu or P. So let's just choose the P such that the derivative at this order is zero. That's called the principle of minimal sensitivity and it's just more or less as sensible as any other principle. So that says you choose P to be right around there, minus a half. And then I can make an error band because I say, I don't know whether that mu hat that I chose, that's minus a half, whether that's the best answer or not. So maybe I could have taken twice that or half that. So I can consider delta two at a half of, so minus one and a half or plus one and a half, that's going a factor of two in either direction. And just count that as an error, as an estimate of the error. That's the estimate of the error from not including more terms and perturbations theory. Uh, I should say that's the guess, but you don't really know. But it's, uh, it's the kind of guess that people usually make a factor of two either way. Uh, so we can look at that guess. So let's look at one more order. So we have the, all the coefficients for third order. Uh, so I've plotted the graph for delta three, that's now the, red, uh, the black line. And well, good, it's right around where all the other curves are at p equals minus a half or p equals zero, it hardly matters. So my lower order estimate was fairly good, but I can ask, is it within the errors that I was estimating before? So let me just expand the scale on that graph. And there's what it looks like with much expanded scale. So now delta one is falling very fast. Delta two has a maximum right there. And the yellow band was my error estimate. And now here's Delta three, that's a better calculation. And now my new estimated best value would maybe be at that inflection point somewhere around there. Uh, you can ask now, well, how about my previous error estimate? Was that a good error estimate or not? And you'll see this kind of graph in lots of papers that do very high order calculations. And so generally look something like this. Uh, and sometimes people say, oh, my new estimate is outside of the air band of the previous estimate and therefore I'm upset. But you know, look where it is. It's one point. If if I count that first error estimate as one sigma error, 
and now it's 1.6 sigma. If you saw an experimental result that was 1.6 sigma away from a theoretical result, you would not be concerned. The criterion for really discovering something is five sigma, not one and a half sigma. Um, so this yellow air band is, you, don't like, you do not expect to be any more accurate than that, but you could be a little off from it. So I would say, just think of it as a one sigma air band. And if you're off by two sigma, that's all right. But you shouldn't be off by five sigma. And one other thing to notice is the new air band would probably be from the maximum to the minimum there. Uh, it didn't get much better. Often the new air band is much smaller than the old air band, but sometimes not. So this is not too unusual, this picture. Okay, so that's about estimating, uh, choosing the scale and estimating the error based on the theory error. Uh, now let's look at what are the effective things beyond the standard model. So suppose there was a new very heavy particle and it had interactions with gluons. So I've drawn a graph with a new heavy particle going around the loop. That's a particle with so massive we cannot yet produce it at the LHC. But supposing you have the hypothesis that there is such a particle, a squark, say, uh, then, <clears throat> well, you should put it into loop graphs, just like I, I showed you here. And that will affect the predictions for lower energies, even 34 GeV. But what's going to happen when I put the heavy particle in a loop? Well, it's the same. You have a somewhat bigger theory, but it affects the renormalization of the strong coupling that's going there. So as long as my scale is much smaller than the mass of that heavy particle, what I see is just a new running coupling. Uh, so here on the bottom was my picture of what I see in a fixed order calculation. And then what I see uh, at much smaller scales down to really, really small time scales or really, really big momentum scales. That's all done with a normalization group. And that affects uh, what happens at scales much bigger than the mass, uh, momentum scales much smaller than the mass of the new particle. So what I conclude from that is I put the new particle in my theory, I calculate, I use a re user normalization to take care of that loop at scales that are much smaller in momentum than the mass. And I I have a big effect. I changed the strong coupling. So that's the strong coupling. And I change it from uh, 0.125 to 0.118. But I didn't know what the strong coupling should be. Uh, this strong coupling is evaluated at MZ. I have no idea what that should be. It's a parameter of the standard model. So I get a new parameter of the standard model. But changing the strong coupling doesn't tell me that there was a new particle going around in a loop. So it's rather sad. The effect of new physics is just to change the value of the couplings and also the masses of the quarks uh, in the standard model. But that's pretty much all. Uh, you cannot find whether there's new physics beyond this one TV kind of scale, uh, unless you really knew somehow what the masses and couplings ought to be. Well, a really good theory would predict the couplings and masses of the standard model, but nobody's come up with such a thing. So we're kind of out of luck. 
except for the possibility of really predicting what alpha strong should be and what alpha electro weak should be. Uh, the secrets of very short distance physics are really pretty well hidden from us until we have enough energy to directly probe the small times. If you get enough energy here so that your diagram in, uh, <clears throat> has energies flowing around in it that are comparable to the mass of this guy, then you don't just do renormalization, then you really see that graph and you'll see different behaviors. But until that, uh, you're out of luck, almost out of luck, but not quite out of luck. So let me tell you about something else. The new to short time physics can introduce small new terms in the Lagrangian, which uh, it's not any longer the QCD Lagrangian or the standard model Lagrangian, it's something with some extra terms in it. So here, <clears throat> here is uh, an extra term. Uh, those are say quark fields or say up quarks and up quarks or up quarks and down quarks with a gamma mu and a gamma mu. And the Lagrangian has to be dimensionless. Uh, the action has to be dimensionless. The, the Lagrangian has to have dimension four, but this operator has dimension six. So there has to be a one over m squared where m squared is the mass squared associated with some kind of new physics that produced that new term. So you call that the effect of Lagrangian, or it's a piece of the effect of Lagrangian. And that kind of a term can lead to an effect on experiment. The effect is small because there's one over m squared, m squared is very big. So the effect is small, but maybe you can see it with some kind of precision experiment. And where should you look? Where you ought to look is signals that are forbidden by symmetries of the standard model. That's a, anyway, one place to look. And if the effect of that kind of a term is just has a, the term has a symmetry, let us say flavor conservation, uh, it, it breaks flavor conservation, but flavor conservation is good in the standard model, then uh, you have a good chance of seeing it. And in addition, since this comes with a one over m squared, then if you look at something dimensionless, uh, to make something dimensionless out of one over m squared, you need e squared over m squared, where e is characteristic of the energy of your experiment. So e squared over m squared increases as e squared gets to be big. So effect from a term like that grows with energy. And you want to then have as much energy as you can, but you don't necessarily have to get to the e squared equal n squared. You can start to see that already at smaller e squareds. So there's been a big effort in the last few years to systematically do this. You systematically make effective field theories. Uh, so you just make up all possible terms with, say, dimension six, and see what the effect of those terms are on experiments. You put in lots of experiments and see if you can eliminate, uh, see if you can show that all those coefficients have to be smaller than something. And maybe some of them aren't smaller than something. And then you can find them. So this is sort of a big effort to do that. Unfortunately, there's lots of terms. So it's a non-trivial uh, effort to write down all possible terms and then systematically look at all possible experiments and all possible terms and see how you can eliminate them. Let me show you an example of that. So what you want to generically consider is data minus theory divided by theory. And it's got a one over m squared, but data minus theory over theory is dimensionless, so it should have some kind of energy squared in the numerator. So you can look for a deviation from expectations that grows with energy. And here's some data. This is real data uh, from a few years ago. This is a jet cross section versus uh, transverse energy, 
total absolute value of transverse momentum for uh, a jet. And one result is from the old CDF experiment, the white ones, and one results from the D0 experiment. And what you see is they're in agreement with theory and still they start to grow. So that's exactly the kind of thing you're looking for. So when this happened and two experiments agreed, there was uh, quite a lot of excitement. Unfortunately, the data were explained by something else. It's real data, they, they, the data are not wrong, but the theory was wrong. Uh, namely the gluon distribution was bigger than people had thought it was. But that's the kind of thing you might see in the future with new data from the LHC. Okay, so let me uh, review that. Loop graphs to know about physics at the very small time scales. And you can remove effects below some time scale one over mu from perturbative graphs and incorporate them into the couplings, for instance, alpha strong of mu. And how can you choose, what mu should you choose when you now do calculations with uh, accounting for the change scale? Something on the order of the physical scale of the problems. And then the effects of very time, small time scale physics are mostly hidden, but you can use uh, effective field theory to try to analyze that and see if you can find such effects, even at scales that are below the scales you need to, to actually see new particles. Okay, so we can move on a little bit. Let's talk about uh, deeply inelastic scattering. And there we have to talk about the effect of the initial state. So I had previously been talking about just the final state, but now we have to look at what happens for initial states before a very hard scattering. So what kind of topics will we talk about? The kinematics, which is quite important, even though people have done deep inelastic scattering, but there's no such experiments going on now, but still it's very important. And the kinematics are important. And then I wanna talk about the space-time picture, uh, what happens at small x, uh, part-time distribution functions and the factored cross-section. And we'll see how far we get. So kinematics. So this is one of the things that everybody knows, provided you've learned it somewhere or other. What it is, is you take a lepton, so think of an electron, plus a hadron, usually a proton, and that makes a new scattered lepton. So K is scattered, changes to K prime, and you exchange, uh, let us say that's a Z boson, and then that's it. You don't measure anything else. So we just measure the new lepton momentum. The X stands for anything else. So capital Q squared is the negative of the momentum of whatever is exchanged. It's K minus K prime squared with a minus sign because uh, <clears throat> the small Q squared is negative. So you'd like big Q squared to be is really big. Well, you know, a few GV was actually what the original experiments were. And that was big enough. And you can also define just from the momenta that you observe, uh, a dimensionless parameter, which is called X. And there's various kinds of X. So this X was made up by James Bjorkane. So it's called X Bjorkane. And it's rather important to say what kind of X you're talking about. So it's nice to mention in the text or label it as X pure king. And deeply elastic scattering, at least as initially conceived, was Q squared should go to infinity with some kind of fixed X. In an actual practice, X can be 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three. That's, uh, but you should think of X as fixed while Q squared is going to infinity. 
And there's some other variables that people always use, so you should know what they are. W squared is a big number. P plus Q squared, which is the mass of the hadron squared, which is often neglected in the kinematics. And one minus X over X times Q squared. So actually, if X is 10 to minus two, the W squared is much bigger than Q squared. X is never really close to one, but it can be quite small. And there's also another uh, dimensionless variable that's p dot q over p dot k, just called y. Okay, so now let's look at what you measure. The cross section, uh, you can analyze using, to start with, only electroweak physics and the symmetries of QCD, but not QCD. In fact, this was all made up before people knew about QCD, but they did know about the symmetries of the strong interactions. So I look at this diagram and I say, well, I scattered my lepton. I exchanged, let us say it's a Z boson. Could have been a photon too, but I just simplify it to just consider Z boson exchange. And there's, D, D sigma is D3 K prime. So that's covariance integration over K prime. And one over Q squared minus M squared, where M is the Z boson mass squared. That's from this propagator. And then there's something having to do with this vertex. Uh, with just uh, factors of K slash and K prime slash and so forth. So you take the trace of the uh, part of the diagram that has to do with the lepton, and it's got two indices because Q has a, is a four vector. I'm uh, sorry, the, the field here for exchanging a boson is the four vector field. So it's L mu nu. There's a gamma mu and gamma mu gamma five at that vertex. So it depends on index mu. And when I square this diagram, there's another index nu. So L mu nu, but you know exactly what L mu nu is. L mu nu here I've got at this trace over um, Dirac matrices, K dot gamma, and then K prime dot gamma, and uh, some vertex, either gamma mu or gamma mu gamma five, and gamma nu. Okay, so that's L mu nu, and you know exactly what that is. But then there's something having to do with the proton and you don't know what that is. So it's just something that people call it W mu nu. And what you know is it has the symmetries of strong interactions. It depends on P, the momentum of the proton, and depends on Q. That's all you know about it. So what can you do with that? It might seem that that's not knowing very much, but let's just try. W mu nu. It's got two indices. And those indices have to go somewhere. So they could go on a G mu nu. They could go on Q. So Q mu, Q nu over Q squared. And that is then a tensor and that's got to multiply a scalar. So the scalar that multiplies that particular tensor has a name, it's called F1. And it is a function only of x, that's x pure k, and q squared. Or you can have p mu minus q mu, p dot q over q squared, and the same thing with nu, and one over p dot q, and then another function that's a function only of x and q squared because it's a scanner. And you might think of some other things to put in here but I have to have current conservation. This is the electroweak current, and that's a conserved current. So if I dot Q into that, I should get zero. And you see, if I dot Q into this, I get Q nu, Q squared over Q squared minus Q nu, so it's zero. So I've put in something I know about the strong interactions. And there's one more term because there's a gamma fives around here. I can have epsilon mu nu lambda sigma p lambda q sigma over p dot q, and that multiplies another scalar f3. 
So those are functions f1, f2, f3, they're called structure functions. And you can measure them in experiment just by measuring d sigma and decomposing it this way. So now let me look at this. You know, what does it look like in space time? Um, in the limit in which Q is very big. So let me choose a convenient reference frame. So I'm first of all going to use plus minus components of all my momenta. I'm choosing a reference frame in which P has got a very big plus component. And I choose it so that the momentum exchanged has both a plus component and a minus component that are both very big and they're equal and opposite. So here's the vector Q, it's got energy zero. Q plus plus Q minus is zero. That's a, just a convenient choice. So in that frame, P is a very big plus component. And if you work it out, P plus is Q over X and P minus is X over Q times the mass of the proton squared. And I've just chosen the frame so that the transverse momentum of everything is zero. And I will often neglect MH squared, and then it's just Q over X. Okay, so there's now my space-time picture. Uh, this is momentum space here. So big plus momentum, small minus momentum. In position space, that means that the uh, plus position is big, uh, plus momentum is big, so the minus position is, uh, the plus position is small. So I think I've got a picture of that. It's a fast moving hadron. So all the plus positions of whatever's going on inside the hadron are all spread out. So I took a proton momentum, a proton at rest, and I just boosted it. So e to the omega is the boost factor, p plus over p plus for proton at rest. And that is q over mass times severe kinetics. x. So inside the proton, there's uh, all kinds of interactions among all the quarks and the gluons. And those interactions are, you may think of as tradition happening at scale one over proton mass. So not this uh, inverse GV, both for delta X plus and delta X minus. However, if I now boost everything by this boost factor Q over MX, remember that's why we did boost, plus things get to be bigger, minus things get to be smaller. So here is Q over MX is very big. Delta X plus gets to be very big and it's Q squared over M squared X. So that's why in this picture, I drew the interactions happening between that point and that point is a big distance. And delta X minus is the same thing, but not times MX over Q. So that's X over Q, that's a small number. So the size of the proton seen in the minus components of moment of positions is small. And the size, uh, the proton just extends out with interactions between the quarks and the gluons spread out over big delta X pluses. So now let's add a virtual photon. A virtual photon has Q minus is really big. So its interaction takes place over delta X plus, which is conjugate to Q minus, that's really small. Delta X plus is one over Q. So I just drew my photon here and uh, X plus separation between what interferes with, well, you imagine interference between two versions of this photon. We've determined the photon position to be in a very small delta X minus region. So I would just say delta X plus is happening inside the proton that scales Q over M squared X, we just discovered that. And delta X pluses that I can determine by my measurement are one over Q. So the 
delta x plus that I uh, see with my photon is way smaller. It's like I have a huge microscope. I can see small time separations inside the proton. And what I see is that the proton is just frozen in time because its interactions, well, there's still interactions, but there's, they're happening over uh, an enormous big time scale and I'm measuring it at an enormously small time scale. That was the original idea between, behind the so-called parton picture, that partons were just frozen and you could see them with what's called impulse approximation by doing deeply elastic scattering. So what does that picture give me? Uh, it says that the cross-section I measure should be the probability that I find a proton, a quark, say, or a gluon inside the proton with some fraction of the momentum of the proton, the fraction I call C. So this is a quark and it's carrying momentum fraction Cp. And it's frozen. So it's got, we don't know the probability to have momentum fraction, say, a third. That's in hard inter uh, the soft interactions. I can't predict it. But whatever that probability is, it's probability that's staying constant as I measure. So I've got a probability f of c times dc. And then I have a cross section to scatter that quark with uh, measuring e prime and omega prime. And I put in a scale mu, we'll you know, get to that in a moment. But f of c dc is the probability to find a parton with whatever flavor. So it's got an index for its flavor in the hadron, carrying a fraction c of the hadron momentum. And then d sigma hat is the cross section for scattering that parton. That's a very intuitive picture invented by Feynman and Bjorkin in the, around, like around 19, late 60s, without knowing about QCD. And let's look at the leading order diagram. That tells us something. But here's the leading order diagram for the hard interaction. So I've got the quark momentum fraction C times P, Lots of plus momentum, hardly any minus momentum. And then I scatter it. So I add momentum Q, which in the frame I've chosen is exactly along the negative Z axis. And I produce a new quark, but that new quark is in the final state. It better be out shell. So what can happen? I transfer this momentum. I've got to get back to a mass shell. So the new uh, plus momentum of this parton is um, zero. C times P plus plus Q plus should be zero. And P plus, I recall, is Q over X times square root of two. Q plus is minus Q over square root of two. So that's telling me that C is X. X this was X Bjorkane. So C is the Bjorkane X. Well, that's pretty amazing. That's the lowest order. F2, that's the structure function that you measure, is, well, sum over the kinds of quarks and their squared charge. And then the parton distribution function with X substituted in, and there's an X from the tensors. So X times parton distribution function is the measured F2. Uh, at higher orders, it is, however, more complicated. At higher orders, then you really have integral dc and parton distribution function as a function of c, and then some new f hat that you calculate. It's an infrared safe measurement, so you can calculate this thing. It is a function of x over c. So the lowest order function is a delta function of x over c, but at higher orders, it's not a delta function. And you find out what F hat is just by calculating that cross-section and perturbation theory and extracting the parton distribution. Oh, 
one thing to just have in mind is that this relation, uh, the lowest order relation, says that F2 is a part time distribution, but that's only lowest order. So sometimes people talk about part time distribution functions as being structure functions. But structure functions are things you absolutely measure from experiment. And part time distribution functions you get in a complicated way from experiment. So there, there are different things and they differ. F2 is not just part time distribution function at uh, higher orders of perturbation theory. And so what do you do at higher orders of perturbation theory? Yeah, then you have this formula with part time distribution function and something you calculate. And what do you use to calculate? Well, here's the leading order diagram. So that's really trivial. But the next leading order diagram has, for instance, a gluon and a proton. And the gluon turns into a quark and an antiquark, and the, the quark scatters. So you have to calculate all kinds of diagrams with that. And now the uh, perturbation theory is more complicated. and x is not equal to c. There's something that's a little bit strange I thought I would mention. How that looks depends on the reference frame. So the bright frame is a frame we've been talking about where q uh, energy is zero. So q plus equals minus q minus. So here's the quark that I hit and I hit it with huge momentum and it goes out in the other direction. And if your cane X is small or if the momentum fraction of that quark is small, then the uh, minus momentum of the, the minus position of the quark can be outside of, the pro of uh, just one over M where the one over m times e to the minus omega. So the proton is really squashed, but this point can be outside of what you might think of as the size of the proton. Size of the proton just being uh, one over m times the boost factor, which made it really small. That's why my yellow thing is really small. Uh, so actually I'm now deviating a little bit from the very simple picture in which everything was inside of the yellow band. It's maybe not if the momentum fraction is small. And most amusingly, if I now Lorentz transform that so that I look in the proton rest frame, then I get this right-hand picture. Now my virtual Z boson has lots of minus momentum, not so much plus momentum and the proton's at rest, so it's going straight up and down. And now the size of the proton is one over m, and the distance between the interactions is one over m, and I'm outside of the proton, and I can be way outside of it. So it rather looks different. It's the same physical picture if you just Lorentz transform the left-hand picture to the right-hand picture, but it looks quite different. In the proton rest frame, the vertex where I interacted with the uh, quark is before the vertex where that quark interacted with something inside of the proton, before in time. And I've not done anything. I actually, to make this picture, I took uh, one of those pictures and actually Lorentz transformed it to make that picture. You can do that graphically by scaling axes. So what does this look like in the proton rest frame, deeply elastic scattering for fairly small x? Well, what's the space-time picture? The size of the proton is uh, in coordinates, space coordinates. The plus size is q over x. And the minus uh, momentum, minus position is x over q. So minus positions are small squished and 
plus positions are spread out. That's what we were talking about. The size of the interaction point, if you like, is one over Q, one over Q. But for small x, this uh, minus momentum, plus momentum, plus position rather, uh, can be outside of the proton because uh, the proton size should have been one over Q and it's Q over X instead. So it's a bigger, it's a bigger position. And the minus position is X over Q and it used to be one over Q. So if X is small, the minus position uh, of the proton is smaller than the minus position of where this point is. So it's really this X over Q can be smaller than one over Q that's telling me that that red point is outside of the blue, the yellow band. So that leads to a space-time picture in the proton rest frame that looks like this. A virtual Z bosons coming along, it creates a quark anti quark pair. Here's my proton, and the quark anti quark pair propagate through the proton. And since it propagates a long way, there can be a, another interaction, a gluon can be emitted, and then a gluon, a quark, and an anti quark propagate through the proton. So that leads to a rather different picture, which has some physical implications if you look that way. Uh, it's telling you that the small x quote structure of the proton that you see in deeply elastic scattering is more like the structure of the vacuum because this all happens in vacuum. That doesn't have so much to do with the size of the proton. Okay. Uh, we should go to seven, my 730. So I think we could probably stop here and just do a couple of questions. And then next time we'll talk about partons and uh, renormalization. On that, do we have uh, some questions? Sounds good. We have a few minutes if people want to unmute. Yeah, it's just two minutes, I think. So it's not a good time to go on to more things. And of course, you guys will be thinking of all kinds of questions as you have dinner, if you're in Europe. And we're, we're going to meet again at this Gather Town uh, app, which is kind of neat. It's like you're in an actual place. And people will be in different rooms. And then uh, I think there's going to be some helpers in each room. And uh, our two speakers for today will just go around to the different rooms. So the groups are supposed to be discussing things, discussing issues. And if they have any questions, when the speakers come around, they can ask them. Or you can ask the speaker to come to room whatever. And if I can, I'll, I'll try to do that. And after that, um, there's games and beer. The beer, unfortunately, is virtual. At a real physical meeting, we have real beer, but the virtual beer you'll have to get out of your refrigerator at home. So I think that'll work out well. You'll see what the gather time looks like if you haven't yeah. used that. So it's kind of yeah, yeah. We'll we'll give a bit of an introduction to that. I think, in as I said, that's twenty hundred euro time in about three and a half hours from now, and then both both Dave and Stefan Prestel will be there and we'll have MCNet and CTEC folks facilitating. So uh, that sounds good. Let me also mention, uh, we we uh, do have the morning lectures from Stefan Prestel. Those are being uploaded. And then as soon as CERN processes uh, Dave's lectures from this afternoon, we'll get those uploaded so you can review those. And again, the slides are on the web so you can review all that. Um, so we'll have all that, but, but again, do, you know, do think of questions because this evening is is open ended. We've got some sort of seed questions to get things started, 
but uh, that's that's a chance to discuss with uh, other other colleagues and uh, other folks. So, okay, um, let's see. I don't see any. Are, are there any hands or questions, Dave? Or I don't see any. I should okay. appear at the top of my on a window here, and I don't see any. Okay. So if if not, we'll sign off then, and we will catch folks in about uh, three and a half hours. And uh, if you miss the morning lectures, those will be posted very shortly and we'll get these up and we'll see the recitation then. So uh, thank you again and have a good uh, uh, afternoon, evening, depending on your time zone. So. See you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. See you later. Hi, Frank. So uh, yeah, I, I posted Stefan's first lecture and I will, uh, I'm in the process of posting his second. And then as soon as Dave's are available, if you send that to me, I'll get those up. Yes, then, thanks a lot. Okay. And then Dave sent me some questions. I will send those around. Uh, and then um, I, I, I confess I didn't catch the end of Stefan. So if he has some questions he wants to Seed with, we'll, we'll get those going. But, uh, so Stefan already had some seed questions uh, throughout the slides. So at least uh, I, it typically was labeled exercise and, and okay. was kind of something to start thinking about or th mm -hmm. discussing of how one would go about solving it, for example. So I think okay. those are also nice for. Okay, I'll, for the I'll, I'll, scan, I'll scan through that and try to put some I, together. I guess so. we should send an email anyway to the facilitators um, who signed up for today and point mm -hmm. them to these. Yeah, yeah, and and I think uh, I I think Mike uh, I, I apologize I think Mike got confused because um, he he pulled the Zoom link from the old email uh, initially. Oh, no. Yeah, I saw he, he initially logged on to the old room. And, yeah, so so uh, yeah, but but the, it'll be good if he can. So we should send the uh, make sure. Um, yeah, they can get the link off the web, but they may not have the password. So it's yes, yeah, it's exactly, good. exactly. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so I think um, what I, I guess I could um, condense Dave's and Stefan's questions into slides or, or a text attachment at the recitation sessions mm -hmm. for tonight, uh, so that they are available to all the facilitators, and yeah. we mm -hmm. could point the facilitators to those and to the password. Yeah. Or even, I mean, yeah, and uh, or you can even send them around with a, um, um, yeah, if it, actually, if you do that, because um, I was going to send something to the, everybody uh, once I get the lectures posted, um, so with, with the YouTube link. So, uh, okay, I, yeah, I can, if, if I can find those, I'll, I'll send those out too. So, uh, yeah, but definitely getting the facilitators the password would be good. So, mm -hmm. so from from the list, um, it looks like uh, including both of us, we're exactly ten. So we both have.